Friends, we are grateful that you have joined us this day for a time of worship and reflection. We know at this juncture in our congregation's life that we are joining in a variety of ways. As a guest, you also may be doing that, joining us through Facebook, through YouTube, perhaps through our church website. Some of us will be joining through a Zoom meeting. And a number are gathered today in our congregational facility for our second Sunday of worship together. However you've come to us, on behalf of the Mechanicsburg Church of the Brethren, I welcome you. I'm Pastor Del Keeney, and it is a privilege again to reflect and to worship with you in this way. This morning we will again be considering the character of God and how that character shapes our lives. One of the things we'll be noting in the scriptures that we read is to talk about the mercy and the grace of God. Many of us are grateful for such mercy and grace, but at the same time we find that our desire for mercy collides with our desire for God to be fair, and just in particular ways. Today we will be considering scriptures that challenge us in our thoughts about God's fairness and God's mercy and grace. As we prepare to enter our worship, we've already been invited through music, giving thanks for the music that draws us in and the images that remind us that God is at work in our world. Just now, let me remind you through the words of the psalmist of God's character and mercy. The psalmist in Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8, writes, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Join me in prayer as we prepare to move further into this time of worship. Holy and merciful and gracious God, We come into your presence, joining those of ancient times who have proclaimed your majesty and the wonder not only of your creation, but of your character. This day, we would open ourselves again to understand more deeply who you are and who you have called us to be through Christ. May we, as we share in this unique way together, find a sense of your presence and may your spirit guide us into a more faithful walk as we follow in Jesus' steps. This is our prayer in his name. Amen. And now, friends, I invite you as we move further into worship to join us as you can in participating in the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, hymn number 521, which we find in our Brethren hymnal. Whether you sing at home, whether you hum along in gathered worship, whether you just reflect on the words, Let this testimony of the hymn remind us of our own invitation 
for God to enter into our lives and guide us by his grace. Let us share together. This morning we gain a glimpse of God's character through the story of Jonah. Our portion of scripture this morning comes from Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 through chapter 4 verse 11. The very end of the book. We remember that part about Jonah in the belly of the whale. We remember him running another direction. But ultimately, Jonah has to come to grips with what God has called him to do. He is a reluctant prophet, but finally he returns, spewed out on the beach by that great fish. And God commands him again to go to Nineveh and to proclaim God's judgment on that great city. One of the things that we don't know, and that we'll talk about further, is that Nineveh is reflective of one of the chief adversaries of Israel and Judah. They are the great empire that has imposed itself and brought destruction on God's people. No wonder Jonah is not interested in speaking God's word, even a word of wrath to these people. Listen as I read and understand why Jonah might be reluctant. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not What I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me. 
for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then God said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals. That's the way the story ends. It is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. And now as you reflect on that story, I invite you to enter this time of interlude between our scripture readings. Stephen Vinson, along with help from our youth, has prepared a reflection set to a wonderful arrangement of amazing grace shared by Amber Grew and Sarah Vinson on flute and viola. Listen and watch and experience the reflections of our youth on this time of pandemic.
as we move from our time of interlude to the gospel reading, I invite you to hear this parable, which Jesus shares in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. An invitation for us to ponder what the kingdom of God is like. Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual day's wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual day's wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This too is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. Join me in prayer. Holy God, may you open the word to us now. In these stories of scripture, allow us to see ourselves and you more clearly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Jonah is one that reminds us that even God's prophets can sometimes be frustrated by the way that God works. All of us, Jonah included, would on the one hand give thanks for God's graciousness and mercy on the receiving end of such grace and care we would be grateful. We would appreciate all that God has done. We might even be humble. But it is not a long distance to the place 
where we begin to compare God's grace to us with grace to another. And when we find ourselves there, well, it's more challenging. Jonah would have been happy for those who were downtrodden and who were struggling to experience the mercy of God. But Jonah was deeply distressed that the place and the people that God would visit God's mercy on would be the Ninevites. These, my friends, were people from the Assyrian Empire at the heart of the empire, an empire that had punished and trampled Israel and Judah, an empire that had deported many and killed others, an empire that prided itself in being the great tree of uh, providence that provided for the whole world. The image of the tree is an interesting one. For in fact, it shows up toward the end of the story. Jonah wasn't adverse to preaching judgment on this people. What he was adverse to was the way that God was. And he was convinced as the story goes, as it's told that God would show up again as God does, as a God of mercy and compassion. And God would relent if the people would repent. And Jonah didn't want that. Jonah wanted fairness. Jonah wanted judgment for what they had done. In fact, as we know, the story plays out. Jonah does not get to see the judgment against the Ninevites. Instead, Jonah experiences a bit of a parable of his own. He builds for himself a bit of shelter. And it cools him in the sun. But God sends a plant. A tree of sorts. A bush. A vine variously called those things, that will shade him. And in fact, he enjoys it. But soon enough, the plant is taken away because God has sent a worm to chew it off. And now Jonah is back in the sun, and then God sends a wind, and the wind parches Jonah's throat makes him faint and ready to die. It is in that moment that God returns to conversation with Jonah and finds that Jonah is as angry as he was before, that God had relented and not judged these people. In answer, God does not punish Jonah. God leaves him with the question, is it not my choice to do what I will with those whom I value? He reminds Jonah that there was a bush, a vine, a plant that had grown up that he did not deserve, that blessed him that graced his life. A plant about which he was sad and even angry when it was gone. But it was God's gift to Jonah. In the same way, Jonah is challenged to think about God's gift, an incomprehensible gift, if you will, to a people who did not deserve that gift from Jonah's point of view or his people's point of view, a people who should have been judged rather than forgiven 
in their repentance. We're left wondering, without a clear answer to God's question, a question that goes with us, is it more important that God be fair or that God be who God is? In the parable about the kingdom of heaven, a familiar one to many of us, Jesus does not tell us who's who exactly in the story. But he leaves us imagining this landowner as being rather peculiar in his characteristics. Peculiar in the sense that he is out on the front lines, for one thing, engaging people in the square for another. Most landowners, most vineyard owners would send their own servants out to do that work. But he goes, and he goes, and he goes again. And at each point in the day, he gathers in those who are there, promising them he will treat them Appropriately. In the end, you know that those who came on at five o'clock at the end of the day were given a day's wage enough to go home, even though they had no work throughout the day, going home with a denarius, enough to take care of their household for that day. The others certainly with good reason, expected some sort of bonus. But they got the same. And it's then that we are confronted in the story, a story that Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, a story that shows us grace rather than fairness. Because the nature of grace is that it comes in ways that are not always fair to everyone. Some work harder than others. Some are closer to qualifying for that day's wage than others. And yet all are privileged to receive what the master has provided. We know in our own lives that it's one thing to think about God's grace to us and it's another to think about fairness in our lives when we observe grace and mercy extended. It is truly a test for us to recognize that the grace and mercy that we would want to qualify is not ours to give. That is a key part of this parable. That grace and mercy is the vineyard owners to give. We get a chance to work in the vineyard. Some of us for a full day. Some of us for a half or less. All of us given the privilege to work and to share. In the end, we all receive grace, though we are tempted to compare what is fair. Certainly in the world, we want folks to experience some level of fairness. But in the kingdom of heaven, we understand that our lives are shaped not by doing what is fair or having it done to us, but being on the receiving end of grace, of mercy, of the incredible character of God. That character continues to teach us and challenge us. You and I, as we walk day by day, are still inclined and tempted to see things as they should be, 
to want the world and our interactions to be fair. Occasionally, they are. Often, they are not. But we are challenged not to cry with sour grapes and to claim disappointment because God is not doing what God should. Rather, we are challenged with humility, as was Jonah, to step back and say, we didn't create that vine. We didn't create the worm. We didn't create the wind. We are the recipients of God's grace, as are our adversaries. Rather than debating whether God is fair, we need to be focused on extending the grace that we have received and sharing our lives in such a way that we aren't hung up on getting what we deserve, but rather we are set free through receiving what we do not deserve by God's grace and mercy. Let us remember the story of Jonah and the parable of Jesus. Let us remember that God is God. And though we would want to make God fair, let us rejoice that God is a God of grace and of mercy and of compassion to our friends, to our enemies, to all those whom God loves. Will you join me in prayer? Oh God, so many times we would want to make you into the perfect God that we would imagine you to be. A God that does what we want. A God who clobbers our enemies and lifts up those we value. But you are not a God like that. The scriptures and the testimony of Jesus remind us that you are our God of compassion and of mercy and of grace. Yes, a God who can be angered by our sin, but a God who will go to great lengths to the utmost length to send your son so that our sin would not be the final word. But your good news in Christ, your forgiving grace in Christ, your resurrection through Christ would be the final word for us. O oh God, continue to shape us by that grace. And remind us of our place in your vineyard, that we may do your will and your work, a work that goes beyond fairness to mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends in Christ, in response to the word that we have heard and the challenge that we have received. I invite you to share in the hymn that we're about to offer to you now. It is a hymn, again written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette, a contemporary hymn writer of lyrics, a hymn that fits the parable that Jesus told from Matthew 20. We will be sharing the words that she has written to the tune of To God Be the Glory, which is number 102 in our Church of the Brethren hymnal. Once again, for those of you joining us by Zoom or at home, you may sing out loud and strong. For those of us gathered in person, we will be humming behind our masks. 
and reflecting on the words and the challenge that we take with us in this hymn. A man owned a vineyard. Join us in the hymn now. God, you give what is yours, more than what we deserve. May we reach out in love where you call us to serve. May we who have witnessed your grace gladly share your justice and love with your world everywhere. As we go this day, brothers and sisters in Christ, may we know that as we go, that the God we serve does not always match with our sense of fairness as we would like the world to be. But the God we serve surely goes beyond our sense of mercy and grace to touch and guide our lives. So may we hope for fairness, but live by grace as we walk in Jesus' steps. May you go this day in Christ's peace and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>